Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Melanie Kay. I am the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program here at Colorado Law. And we have had the honor and privilege over the past two years to partner with Silicon Flatirons for this absolutely incredible series on artificial intelligence and ethics. Um, it's been a wonderfully successful series um, and just an incredible range of speakers and topics. And that will continue on tonight. Um, so I would like to introduce Harry Surden, and he will introduce our speaker and kick things off. Harry is a professor of law here at Colorado Law. He joined the faculty in 2008. His scholarship focuses upon legal informatics, artificial intelligence and law, including machine learning and law, legal automation, and issues concerning self-driving autonomous vehicles. He also studies intellectual property law with a substantive focus on patents and copyright and information privacy law. Prior to joining CU, Professor Surden was a resident fellow at the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford Law School. In that capacity, he conducted interdisciplinary research with collaborators from the Stanford School of Engineering, exploring the application of computer technology towards improving the legal system. He was also a member of the Stanford Intellectual Property Litigation Clearinghouse and the Director of Computer Science and Law Initiative. He was a law clerk to the Honorable Martin Jenkins of the U.S. District Court for Northern District of California in San Francisco. He received his law degree from Stanford Law School with honors and was the recipient of the Stanford Law Intellectual Property Writing Award. So we are very lucky to have Professor Surden here with us and as one of our ethics fellows this year. Um, and I will let Harry take it from here. Well, uh, thank you, Melanie, so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm so honored. Uh, as Melanie said, I'm Harry Surden, I'm a law professor and also a former software engineer who researches, uh, researches artificial intelligence and law. I'm also a director of the Silicon Flatirons Artificial Intelligence Initiative. Uh, we're so pleased to have you all here tonight at our Artificial Intelligence and Ethics Speaker Series, sponsored by Silicon Flatirons and by the Daniels Fund initiative. Um, as we all know, AI is advancing very rapidly, and we as a society must be thoughtful as it becomes integrated and changes our lives and society. Uh, and to that means uh, we have a terrific speaker. But before I introduce our speaker, I first want to thank all the amazing people who came together to make this event happen tonight, uh, most particularly our amazing Silicon Flatirons team, Nate Mariotti, Christine McCloskey, uh, Sarah Schnickrand, Shannon Sturgeon, and our executive director, Brad Bernthal. I'm also grateful to the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative for sponsoring this uh, and thankful for the great work of Melanie Kay and also Michelle Logan. Um, before we introduce our speaker, I wanna talk about two events that are coming up that might be of interest to the AI community. On April 18th, we're gonna have our final set of speakers in our AI and ethics series. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on artificial intelligence and bias. We're gonna be having Newton Campbell, Christine Goodman, and Spencer Overton. That's Wednesday, April 18th from 12 p.m. to 1.15 p.m. And then, or is that Thursday, April 18th? And then um, on Friday, April 19th, uh, we will be putting on a conference on artificial intelligence and the US Constitution. I believe this is one of the first conferences of its kind where we're combining US constitutional law and issues related to artificial intelligence. That will be co-hosted by the Byron White Center um, as part of their annual Roth Gerber conference along with the Silicon Flatiron. So that should be very interesting at that conference. We'll be looking at issues of AI generated speech and the First Amendment. We're gonna be looking at AI interpretation of legal documents such as the Constitution. So a lot of really interesting topics. Uh, I hope you can join us there. So turning to the main topic, we are so honored to have our fabulous speaker here tonight, Professor Anthony Aguirre. Uh, Professor Aguirre has tons of accomplishments, but in the interest of time, I will only highlight uh, some of the uh, most important ones. So uh, Professor Aguirre is a professor of physics and cosmology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He received his PhD from Harvard University 
And in addition to being a very highly cited and influential physicist who researches basic questions about the origin of the universe, uh, Professor Geary is also a highly regarded expert in artificial intelligence, the topic of tonight. And in this regard, Professor Geary is also the executive director of the well-known Future of Life Institute, or FLI. And that is a nonprofit organization focused on steering transformative technologies like AI in a positive direction for society. So in the talk tonight, Professor Aguirre will talk about the transformation of artificial intelligence and how we can ensure that this rapidly progressing technology can serve the public interest. Uh, I've known Professor Aguirre for a very long time, and uh, I can say without doubt he is one of the most thoughtful and smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, we are so honored to have such an accomplished speaker here tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Anthony Aguirre. Thank you, Harry, for the embarrassingly overkind introduction. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks uh, for the invitation and to the Flatiron Institute for, for uh, hosting this series. It's, it's great to be here. Um, so, so I want to give a start with a kind of review of what got me into this field. You know, I, as, as Harry said, I'm a cosmologist and physicist by trade, but I've kind of been uh, spending more and more of my time thinking about AI and the effects of AI, uh, largely because I just think it's become such an important issue. Uh, so just to, to briefly recap the history of artificial intelligence, um, very, very briefly, there was a long time in which it basically didn't work. Sorry, and, and the, for the people who worked on it during that period, I really apologize. I know that it was a really interesting field, but like I think you'll agree, uh, it didn't really do anything like it was people were hoping it would. But that sort of changed, and it changed really in a little bit over the last decade, uh, where in some level, I think narrow AI has been solved. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, starting in 2013, uh, this was a wake-up call for me, seeing the deep learning techniques applied by then small startup DeepMind to Atari, and seeing that a AI system could just learn just from seeing the pixels and being able to control things how to play a video game. And this is, I, I would say that this actually partly led to the foundation of the Future of Life Institute in 2014, seeing, oh my God, this is suddenly something that's happening. It looks kind of... Uh, ridiculous compared to today's AI systems, but this was a big deal back then. Um, lots more people, I think, became aware of the quick advances when, Alpha, when AlphaGo defeated uh, Lee Sedol as the, the World Go champion. That was a game that people thought could take decades more for computers to be competitive with humans. Uh, the first really major scientific problem, I think, solved by AI, AlphaFold in 2018 and 2020, the, the protein folding problem had been sort of defeating physics for just decades. Um, and AlphaFold essentially now knows how to fold proteins and has folded basically all of them, um, and they're available online. Uh, then there was more progress. Again, in, this was coming out of DeepMind and game playing. You could take an AI system that didn't even need any data. It could just self-play and learn how to play chess and Shoji and uh, Go and Atari. Um, and would attain sort of human capability or transhuman capability in a matter of like hours of training against itself. So this was suddenly seeing that this was sort of no joke anymore. It was becoming human level in short amounts of time. Um, and then in the sort of early 2020s, we saw generative AI come into the fore. I remember being astonished at the fact that uh, like visual data and generating visual images and language could be combined, just sort of combining the two together and it just worked. Uh, this is Dali from 2021, showing that you could prompt it with an illustration of a baby penguin and a cape playing a grand piano and get these pictures. I was amazed at the time. This is 2023 Dali 3, same prompt. Um, and here you can see just the astonishingly rapid progress that there's been uh, in generative AI in just two years. You know, this is complete night and day. And so we're now at the, at the point where I would say, that, and this is being a little bit unfair also, but I think it's uh, sort of true, that if you can clearly specify the task, if you can come up with a good metric for it, if you can make it a well-defined thing that you, have to, you can tell an AI system exactly how well it's doing at it, you can probably train a machine learning system that will perform that task generally at a superhuman level. 
So if the task is fairly narrow and very well defined, we kind of have enough techniques in AI to now do that. And you can see these, these are sort of progress curves that you see uh, in this graph. And they're getting, uh, that progress is getting more and more rapid in the sense that you saw that it took sort of 20 years in, in like handwriting recognition, but the curves on the right are like vertical. Once people start applying current AI techniques to narrow problems, they just solve them fairly quickly. So that's narrow AI. But that's never really what AI researchers wanted. They wanted what they thought of as general intelligence, the sort of intelligence that we have, the sort of intelligence that makes humans the predominant species on Earth that's controlling sort of the destiny of the planet rather than chimpanzees or gorillas, which are just as smart as we are in certain ways, uh, but they don't have certain capabilities that we have. And so this was always kind of the dream that, that AI would do the sort of range of flexible, uh, intuitive, common sense understanding, uh, intellectual uh, uh, things that, that humans could do. And kind of out of the blue, um, these large language models, which were trained just to predict words, like to predict the, the next word in a sentence, a so sort of super-powered autocomplete, um, emergently exhibited understanding and reasoning and sort of an, an amazing level of generality. And this is, I think, really interesting to, to think about why that happened, because I think this is a surprise to a lot of people that these models uh, could do so, as much as they could do just from word order. But when you think about it more, it makes some sense. So, so I thought it would be fun to play a little AI training game. So I'm gonna be the data set, um, and you're gonna be the AI system that is learning word prediction. So your job is, I'm gonna start a sentence. Uh, this is something that would be said by me, and you're gonna guess how the sentence or, or what word would fit in there. So if I say, hi, my name is, what would you guess is the next bit? Anthony, yeah, so that's right. Now it could have been uh, Professor Aguirre if I was more formal, it could have been like irrelevant to the point that we're trying to make here. Uh, it could have been a few other things, but by far the highest probability was Anthony and you, you got that right. And so your training, you get a little bit of like reward or, or lack of penalty for getting that right. Uh, and, and you could compare with the probability distribution you might've had in your mind and train your neural network a little bit. Now suppose I said this sentence, as we stand on the cusp of creating AI that surpasses human expertise, blah, 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 the delves into the profound, anyone? This is, I wrote this recently, it's the description of this talk. Ethic, ethical consequences, yeah, uh, or considerations, I got it wrong. Um, so now, if you were an AI system, you would, because you didn't quite know that one, you had some, maybe you had some guesses, uh, you would do this fancy uh, operation on your neural network weights uh, that would make it so that next time you came across that same or a similar sort of thing, you would get that, you'd be more likely to get that right. Okay, so, so at this point, it sort of feels like, well, I'm just kind of memorizing or like figuring out patterns and things. Um, here's an easy one. Two. Right? You don't have to think too hard about that. That just pops into mind because you've, you've seen many instances as as a language model of one plus one equals and two following it. So that one you can just remember. What about this one? Oh, uh, you probably haven't seen that particular math problem before, right? Uh, a language model probably hasn't either. So if you want to make a good guess, you're going to have to have some kind of patterns like probably it has like nine digits. Probably it starts with a one because three times three is... 3 point something times 3 point something is like 10. Um, so you can make some sort of guess. Um, there's the answer. If you wanted to do like a good guess, you'd have to have really good ways of uh, doing that intuitive, intuitively. If you wanted to get it right, you would have to really have your neural network trained in some other way that would uh, have some symbolic way of manipulating things and getting to that answer. And neural networks have done both of these. So if you ask, if you ask GPT-4, say, right now, this problem, it will actually just call up a calculator. Okay, so it knows how to do that. Um, if you asked it this a year ago, it would kind of guess and get something that was close to right, but wasn't quite right. And if you asked it an addition problem that was simple enough, it would actually figure, it would actually know what the operations were to do the addition problem. So it was like in between figuring out the symbolic version, um, learning how to use tools, and this very intuitive version. So you can see that like just by requiring autocomplete, you're forcing the model to learn certain capabilities that aren't just autocomplete. It learned mathematics, it learned addition at least, and it learns like a little bit of multiplication. Okay, so here's another one that 
hopefully everyone should know, because we're all relativists here, given any space time there exists the freedom to deform it by an arbitrary conformal transformation without disrupting the causal structure. Yeah, so, so if you want to predict me, like, you're going to have to know some physics. You know, I'm a physics professor. If you want to know, like, if you want to do a really good job, you're going to have to know quite a bit of physics. And so, although it's at some level just word completion, if you want to do it really, really accurately, there's a bunch of stuff you're going to have to know. And the same thing with an AI model that is learning it. If you crunch the numbers long enough so that the AI system can get really, really good at word prediction, it, that is a sort of general ability to do uh, all sorts of intellectual tasks, because many, many intellectual tasks can be posed as blah, 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 and then the answer goes at the end. And so if you want to get that answer accurate, you're going to have to know how to do those intellectual tasks. So that's level five. Just do 50 billion more times or so of that, and you will be a large language model. Um, and you can see that you know, 50 billion times for us, that like if you did one per second, that's like 1,000 years. Um, so that's a lot of work that you would be doing a lot of iterating. And so what does that lead to? Um, so I think uh, many people are lawyers. Are there lawyers in this room? I think there's some, right? Yeah, yeah. So this one probably smarted a little bit. Um, when OpenAI came out with GPT-4 and it could pass the bar exam, uh, 90th percentile for GPT-4. Um, it does good physics too, so don't feel too bad. Um, and uh, we saw that it could pass you know, a lot of other exams, SATs and uh, LSATs and their GREs. There's a whole list off the bottom of this chart that you're not seeing. Um, Claude 3, by the way, is better than GPT-4 significantly at the bar exam. So just a product endorsement. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so we've seen that just through you know, this text completion process and huge, huge, huge amounts of training and data, um, that these large language models have gotten sort of general, uh, some very general capabilities. Um, and there's more that goes into the reinforcement learning part that is added to the, to the, the, the base model that is just trained for, through word completion, but that's like where all the, the, the real firepower is coming from. Um, it also should be said that AI models have real advantages over humans, like I did an informal coding speed trial between me and GPT-4. Um, it, it did a lot better. Um, even worse, uh, my poetry writing speed was just totally not competitive. Um, and, and it's even worse than this because GPT-4 at some level or, or any language model, you can scale up the computational resources that you give it and make it go faster. This only runs at one speed. Um, and so there's a, real, there's a real advantage that machines have in some of these intellectual tasks over humans. Um, so, we're now at this point where we have these systems. They've been around, you know, GPT-4 has been around for a year, like almost as of today. It was like a few days ago, I think, that was the one year anniversary. Um, and they're in some level really impressive. Um, and in some level, there's a lot of skepticism about them. We're in this strange place where if you go, you know, on online discussions or talk to people, you both get like, this is amazing. There's gonna be like incredibly powerful AI systems, you know, in a year or two. Um, and you know, this is really a breakthrough. And you get people saying, well, this is just you know, parroting back and like, copying the stuff that it saw, and it's not really intelligence, and it's not really smart. Um, and it's almost like, how can these two people be looking at the same thing? And yet, that's where we are. So what I would encourage, um, in terms of figuring out for yourself whether there's sort of more hype or underestimation, is the following thought. Well, let me, let me ask you first, how many people have spent like an hour interacting with GPT-4 or Claude or uh, one of those models. Okay, so quite a good fraction. How many of you have shelled out the 20 bucks to get like the, the top of the line one? Okay, great. So for those of you who haven't, uh, I would suggest it. So here's my prescription for, for informing yourself of this. Plunk down 20 bucks uh, to get the full power subscription to GPT-4 or Gemini Ultra or Claude 3. That's the newest one. Um, Invent five questions with well-defined answers that you think would be easy for like an advanced law student or master student or PhD student or something in your favorite field, but would be hard for an AI to answer. So give yourself that kind of quasi-Turing test of 
think of something that's human advantaged and that humans should be able to do really easily, but would be hard for the AI system to answer. Then just try it out, ask them to the AI system, do some follow-ups to feel like if you really feel like it's understanding the question that you're asking. Um, bonus points if you ask them to a reference human and compare. And then, um, so I'm not an industry shill, cancel your subscription. Um, <laughs> I think this is worth the 20 bucks because you really get a sense, you, you read things about these systems, but unless you're like really trying them out and using them and using the full power ones, I think you don't really have that sense and you, you're not really entirely clear on what you're working with. Now I'll also say that even when you do use them all the time, as many of us do, it's still pretty weird to know like how much does it really understand that thing? How, like is it really getting that or is it just words? So we're, we're still in a kind of weird uncanny valley between overhyped or underestimated. Um, and we will see relatively soon what that looks like because um, what's gonna happen next, I think we can guarantee is that this general purpose AI is going to get better. Um, why do we think that? Well, the thing that has made the large language models at least, and, and now they're not just language, but, but starting to become language and video and speech and, uh, and images, what is really contributed to that is using more computation, more data and more computation. So this plot on the left uh, is showing as a function of different years from 2014 to 2044, how much training, so this is the number of computations in truly astronomical numbers of like 10 to the 24 or 10 to the 25, how many computations were used in training uh, these different models. You can see GPT-4 is that diamond way at the top. Um, and you can see this, this is a log plot. So on the vertical axis is going like 10 to the 21, 10 to the 20. So this is 10 times more training each, each notch you go up here. Um, and <clears throat> the reason that that, has been, that trend has been there is because it's paying off. The more training, the more data, um, and the more parameters that go into these models and there are relationships you wanna have between those, the better they are. And they're better in a way that is very quantifiable. So, so somewhat surprisingly, um, it's turned out that there are like deep regularities in the amount of computation and parameters and data that you put into these models and how well they do at their job, which is word prediction. Um, so you see that this, this plot on the right, this is uh, basically one model, but trained just a little bit on the left, more and more and more and more and more. So there's different versions with different amounts of training. GPT-4 is the, the little green dot way on the right. And you can see that the, this is basically the amount of error, um, the, the sort of comparison between the prediction and the, the thing that it was trying to predict uh, is the curve. And you see that as you get more training, it like very smoothly gets more and more accurate. And that more accurate turns into more capability in some way. So this is a similar curve that was drawn for uh, how well it does on some coding problems. So these are little like coding, like write a little program that does this. Uh, so there's a whole suite of these that they tested it on. And you can see that there too, there's this like fairly smooth improvement in how well it does in coding problems. So, so we pretty much know that if we, um, if we go farther and use more computation, the model is gonna get more accurate. It's gonna be better at the thing that it does, which is predicting words. And we know that there will be some relation between that and the sort of cognitive or, or like intellectual tasks that it's doing. We just don't know quite what that relation will be. So, what, so, so we'll get better. It'll get better at the thing that it's doing, which is word prediction and the things that that translates into somehow. It will get more multimodal. So we've already seen this. JPT-4 came out um, with just text. It, now you can upload images and it can make for you images. Most of the other models, uh, you can upload images now too. Uh, there is now, you probably saw SOAR, this video generation capability. There will be video uh, input capability as well. So it's already the case that AI models can uh, generate text, speech. Here, text and speech, they're gonna, they can see images, they can generate images, and video is kind of the next thing. They're gonna get more composite um, when you first started, you know, if you first booted up GPT-4 back a year ago, uh, you were essentially just interacting with the neural network. If you call up GPT-4 now, what you're actually interacting with is a sort of complicated software system where GPT-4 is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but there are other things. Like if you, like I said, if you ask GPT-4 to multiply two big numbers together, it's not just gonna guess, it's gonna call it, it probably will actually just write a little piece of code that multiplies those two numbers and execute that code. 
So this is like now what it's doing. Um, so it's, it's hooked up to something that it can write code in and something that can execute that code and feed the answer back into GPT-4. There are also things where GPT-4 will have some output uh, and another language model will read that output and check whether it agrees with it or not. You can have like different versions of GPT-4 generating different uh, pieces of text and something else will combine or compare them. So, so we're into a picture where behind the scenes a lot more complicated things are going on um, and the models are getting not just to be sort of a simple neural network, but a, a whole system of like wrappers and combinations of neural networks into a composite system. I think it's clear that we'll see more of that. Um, and things are gonna get more agential. What do I mean by that? Meaning, you know, current language models, they kind of just sit there, you, you tell them something and then they give you an answer. There's, they get to do a little bit of action. Um, if you, you know, like I said, if you, if you ask a, a computational thing, it might do something. Uh, you know, you don't have to tell it to write a program uh, and execute the program and get the answer back. It will just do that because it knows that that's the thing that it should do in order to get you the answer you want. There's gonna be more and more of that. So it's, it's clear that the AI companies are working hard on getting things that you give tasks or goals and they go and figure out what, it has, what they need to do to uh, accomplish those tasks or achieve those goals and then go and do it. Um, so, so that I think is gonna be a major transition that is coming up. So in short, I think the, the current situation we're in is that general purpose AI is here. It's sort of human competitive in the sense that you can take intelligence or like uh, standardized tests like GREs and bar exams and so on, uh, and it can do kind of as well as humans in a lot of those things uh, in text and image-based tasks. And it's now going to steadily get better. Uh, it's gonna get better, I expect, quickly, but we don't know how quickly. Um, just extrapolating the fact that it's been very quick for the last few years, we can guess that it's gonna be fairly quick, but what exactly that means, I think we don't know. Um, and also I think it's very important to realize that there's nothing super duper special about the human level of capability at almost all of the things that we do. I mean, we already saw that, uh, you know, GPT could, you know, write code as fast as a, or like, GPT can write code pretty well, like not as well as a professional computer programmer, but as well as like a, a CS student maybe, but it can also write it much, much faster. Um, and the, the narrow AI systems that we've seen uh, like didn't stop at human level of chess or Go or anything like that, they blew right past it. Um, so there are many things in narrow AI systems where it's subhuman and then it's human level for like a minute and then it's superhuman. And I think I see no reason to expect that that's going to be different with these general purpose systems. Um, now different capacities are gonna evolve at different rates. So it's clear that language models are really good at some things and put quite bad at some other things. Um, so there, there will be differential capability improvement as compared to what humans do, where we evolved and sort of learned in a very particular way that is quite different from language models. So we're gonna have different capabilities at different times. Um, but there's no particularly good reason to think any of them are just gonna stop at human level. Now, I think um, this rate's very high on the bigness meter. I, I brought a bigness meter. Um, and because I'm a cosmologist, it, it really goes big at the, at the, at the right end. Um, something rather than nothing, existence of the physical universe, beginning of life, uh, sliced bread is on the other side. So where is AI? I think we don't quite know, um, but I think it's safe to say that it's gonna be somewhere in between computers and the beginning of life. Now that's a bold statement, right? Computers are a big deal, um, but AI is fundamentally changing the way we do computational tasks. So the, all the things that sort of computers do, writing programs, uh, is not gonna be the way that most people interact with computers for very long. We're gonna have intelligent systems that we're talking to, they're figuring out what to do, they're like learning what is necessary to get them done and they're doing them. Um, all the way at the, on the sort of biggest end, beginning of life, that seems grandiose, but really we are generating a new sort of intelligent thing on Earth that has a whole different architecture than us. Um, it is possible that it will evolve. It is possible that it will, uh, that we will improve it or it will improve itself. This could be the beginning of a very long time of AI in the universe, just like the beginning of life was a very long time for biological life in the universe. So it's somewhere in between there, but it's all pretty far on the bigness meter. Um, and hence, uh, I and we are here today. 
So <clears throat> what's the upshot of that? Like, how and why does it matter? Well, um, this is enormous benefit for us. So I, I think there's a, there's a sense in which, you know, there are lots of different definitions of intelligence. Um, but one of the definitions that is sort of simplest and, and pretty applicable is intelligence is your ability to figure out how to achieve your goals. Um, and more intelligence means that you achieve more goals. And so more intelligence in the world means that more goals can be achieved. Now, you have to have the right goals, um, and that is really, really important. But in principle, if your goals are good, more intelligence is just a strictly good thing. It lets you get much more of what you want. And so AI can help us achieve a tremendous amount uh, of the things that we want. There are some minor issues um, on the negative side. Um, these are sort of risks that are also ethical issues. There are going to be economic effects, job automation and technological unemployment, concentration of economic power, bias and inequity. Um, we could see various uh, things coming out of corporations. I'll talk a little bit more about that that are not as pro-social as they could be. Um, an epistemic apocalypse where nobody knows what is true anymore because of deep fakes and generative in disinformation and flooding the inf of the information commons uh, and people not knowing how to do anything because AI is doing it all for them. Um, social and political breakdown from the misinformation, election undermining, government control and surveillance, uh, cybersecurity risks from AI that can not just program, but can hack, um, whether that will be a like net positive or negative because it's you know, better cyber defense or better cyber offense, we don't know. Um, proliferation of risky tech, if you can have an AI system that knows how to design biological weapons or chemical weapons, let's hope that it doesn't get into the hands of people who want to design those but don't know how to do it themselves. Um, AI is getting built into weaponry, into autonomous weapons that can kill people, uh, even into AI, into, even into command and control systems. Um, and we could see arms races between nations. We, we see one sort of brewing between the US and China where there's a lot of saber rattling or GPU rattling or something. Um, and we could see AI being incorporated into uh, intelligence or, secu or security services in very uh, problematic ways. So, th so there's a lot of issues and a lot of ethical considerations around all of these. I, I wanted to focus on two big sort of ethical questions for the remainder of this talk. The first is, um, let's think about this relation between the AI systems that we're using uh, as people and as a society and the companies that are providing them and generating them and profiting off of them. So, so to get you thinking about this, I would like to first give you a little pitch for my new law firm, Aguirre gp and So it's, it's an awesome business model that I came up with. Um, there's, there's a legal advisor, there's a client. The legal advisor gives free legal advice, who doesn't want that, um, on the basis of data that they get from their client. And then the legal advisor, that's my law firm, just takes that data and sells it to companies that can then generate ads for those people. <clears throat> so that's a great business model, right? Uh, and I've got a similar one for, for uh, <clears throat> personal assistants with basically the same model. I even have one for doctors um, where it works a little bit differently where the drug companies can give money to the doctor to recommend some particular drugs to the clients. Um, making money hand over fist with this, I hope you'll invest. Um, so is anyone troubled by this a little bit? Um, don't worry, because I fixed it. It's an AI legal advisor. It's not a human one. Um, so I think you can all probably recognize, A, that this is the way a lot of our information systems work now in our ad-driven model, um, and B, that there's something very, uh, in, very in tension between this sort of a uh, monetization system and what we consider the fiduciary duties that, that lawyers or doctors or personal assistants have, right? If you're going to your doctor, you expect that that doctor is going to uh, act in your interest. They've got a duty of care and loyalty to you. They're not supposed to have a conflict of interest between you and some medical company. We know that sometimes happens, uh, but we have professional standards that say that your primary duty uh, as a lawyer or as a financial advisor or as a doctor is to your client or your patient, uh, right? So, <clears throat> We can talk about this in terms of, uh, I think, a useful concept of loyalty, where we can say a party A is loyal to a party B, 
to the degree that it adopts that party B's goals and interests as its own. So when you go to the doctor, um, the doctor, <coughs> if the doctor is doing their job well, tries to understand what are your needs, what are your goals, what are your interests, and those become important to the doctor. Right? Those are then what the doctor is trying to fulfill. As a lawyer, you do, you do the same thing. Your opinions are there to be helpful to your client. Whatever the client is trying to accomplish or what is, their, their goals are, you want to help them. Um, and so we have systems of ensuring, uh, and like by professional standards and so on, loyalty in many of our professions to their clients. And that's tremendously reassuring uh, to the clients that have that fiduciary relationship with the doctor or the lawyer or the financial uh, advisor. And it's there for a good reason, because there are sort of power disparities and knowledge disparities that, that just make it like very much more pro-social to have that sort of fiduciary relationship uh, between the two. Um, this is sometimes when it's applied to AI, discussed as aligned to, like is there alignment between the interests and goals of an AI system and its user or its operator? Now, <clears throat> when you talk about <clears throat> any relationship between a client and a service provider, whether it's an AI or, or a person or a company, there are some tensions, right? There's a tension between what the individual wants versus what the like society may want or what the collective may want. Um, so I can, there are certain things, you know, where, um, you know, if I'm operating on Google, this is, this is a, an example that we, we talked about in our paper, I think at some point, you know, if I'm going on Google Maps, um, sometimes Google Maps will not show me the actual fastest route because it goes through some random little neighborhood. If it took everybody through that random little neighborhood, it would suck for the people in that neighborhood, right? So it doesn't actually tell me the thing that I individually want, which is the fastest route. It balances that with a more collective or societal need um, and, and realizes that, you know, you can't just treat everyone in isolation. We also have certain, uh, certainly, like if I ask my assistant to do something highly unethical or illegal, hopefully they will say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, if I talk to my, you know, if like doctors will have to sometimes ration medical care, um, lawyers, I, they, they don't have any ethical scruples. I, yeah, okay. Um, so, so there's that tension. And then of course there's conflict of interest. Um, so there is almost, often the possibility for conflict of interest between any two people. Um, and same thing with a, with a person and the provider of an AI system. So if I go to uh, Amazon and you know, there is a personal, so this is not a realistic, I'll go to company X and company X has a uh, assistant that helps me choose products. Um, that, there are some products that that thing could recommend that would make its owner company more money and less money. It might have too many of you know, one product and wants to sell off some of these. And it's gonna be awfully tempting for the AI system to take that into account when recommending something to me. So there's a conflict of interest between me, I just want the best thing, and between the company that's providing that AI assistant or search or, or like uh, ranking engine or recommendation engine, uh, that company and me, we have an inherent conflict of interest that has to be resolved some way or another. Uh, we see this in our current social media platforms where the company has an interest in you being upset and staying on and staying engaged for as long as possible. You have an interest in getting like interesting, useful, uh, enriching stuff. Um, usually one of those wins rather than the other because of the way we've set that system up. Um, and so that question is gonna come as more and more of our digital economy is mediated by AI systems where we're interacting with the system and the system is interacting with the rest of the digital world. These things are gonna come up more and more and more. So um, something that I, so, so the idea that, uh, and this is work that I did with, with uh, your illustrious colleague, Harry, uh, we talked about loyalty in AI or fiduciary AI saying that we should create AI systems that avoid conflicts of interest and or resolve them in favor of the user. Um, and you can see more in this paper if you'd like to. This is not necessarily the trajectory that we are on. Um, Ad-driven models for, you know, are the models for much of the internet. There aren't any real regulations or standards around this. So, so there are standards around human conduct 
as doctors and lawyers and, the, and so on. And those get inherited a little bit by the AI systems. Um, but, and there, but there aren't, there is no law, for example, that when you're interacting with an AI system that's acting like a lawyer, that it has to have, or the company providing it has to have a fiduciary relationship with you. Um, I think there probably ought to be such a law, but at the moment there's not, and there's sort of a patchwork of how that gets uh, operation, operated. Um, there are huge and growing power differentials. You, you see this, you, like you as a poor, finite human being have to interact with a giant uh, information ecosystem that has huge amounts of data and he, about you, uh, about you know, statistical regularities. It has huge computational power, all being exerted to sell you stuff. Right? And this is a huge differential. I think we will uh, greatly benefit if we have some of the power of AI on the side of the individual and not just uh, on the side of the corporations that are providing it. There's some good news, which is that uh, the, so far as AI assistants largely are following a subscription model rather than an advertisement-based model, I think that's, that's good. And I think um, there's something really nice about having a fiduciary relationship with someone. You just feel good that like your interests are taken to heart and they're like they're acting in your interest. It's a nice relationship. And so I think I'm optimistic that if we have that sort of high trust model, that that, that can be like very economically successful and hopefully we can, that can actually become dominant in the field. So that's the first ethical question. How do we, how do we mediate as these AI systems become more and more intermediaries between individuals and society and the information ecosystem? How do we mediate that in a way that works well for us? Now the second question, should we build superhuman general purpose AI? So what do I mean by that? Um, there are a whole bunch of different terms that are confusingly defined um, that mean somewhat similar things, superhuman general AI or super intelligence or artificial general intelligence um, that are different strengths or flavors of general purpose AI like we have now, but that is better than the best humans, not just some humans and not just some things, but better than the best humans at essentially all important cognitive tasks. So this is a high bar, um, and we can, and, but it is the explicit goal of the companies that are building AI. OpenAI, Open Anthropic, Google DeepMind, and numerous other AI companies are explicitly working to build super, this artificial general intelligence or superhuman general AI. And they are making steady progress. Um, if you ask people, is it possible and when, you get an astonishing variety of answers. Um, Elon is currently at one to five years. Dario Amade, that's the Anthropic CEO, is at two to five-ish. Sam Altman at, C at OpenAI, two to five. So this is not something that is now like 30 years away always. Um, we are now down to the point where the companies working on it say that it's a handful of years away. And I think that is sobering. Uh, a couple of like classic AI experts, Yoshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton, three or five to 20 years. Google C CEO of DeepMind, um, Dennis Sasabis within the decade. Um, in my copious free time, I, I, I helped create a prediction platform called Metaculus, which is fun to check out. Um, it gives 50% by 2030, and I probably trust that one the most. Um, and there are some people who are out there uh, saying more than 10 years, 20, 30, uh, but there are very few people now saying it's impossible or it's centuries away. This is just not where people are anymore for this. And some people saying that it could be quite soon. So how, how could it be quite soon? That, that I think is a surprising claim probably. And I, I see two paths why it could come sooner than we might think. One is this scaling. So I talked about that before. Um, there's a gigantic effort to put more computation, more data, more parameters into the models. Um, and we saw that from GPT-3 to GPT-4, there was about 100 times the computation, 10 times as many parameters. Um, and so what happens if we do that again? What happens if we 10x the number of synapses or, or neurons and 10x the training time? We don't know, nobody knows. So that would look like extending this graph a little bit farther. Now it might seem like um, this is flattening out and so there's just a little bit of extra uh, between you know, the, the green point and where you would get to. But remember, like all the low hanging fruit has already been picked. Like these models know how to do lots of stuff. So it might be that that extra little bit is like the uh, conformal transformation bit 
or the extra little uh, step that it takes to get the math problem right, or some piece of difficult physics or legal scholarship or whatever, all the easy stuff is done. So how like getting 1% more accurate, 1% can be a lot if it's the hardest 1% of stuff that you're now getting right. So, so we don't know what this, what this is gonna translate into. We know that the last increase of you know, 100 times in the training um, and 10 times the training time and 10 times the synapses was a huge jump. We don't know what the next jump is gonna be. Um, if we look at biology, um, if we think of someone with 10 times the synapses and, and like learn stuff for 300 years, what would that person be like? I don't know, do you know? I don't know, probably pretty smart, but it's hard. <laughs> how smart is really hard to say. And that's, we're, so we're really going into sort of unknown territory at this point. So that's the scaling. It might just be that by scaling up by 100 times or 1,000 times or 10,000 times, which we're going to do, um, these systems just get to be incredibly competent in a whole bunch of things. That's one route. Another route is self-improvement. So right now we have human engineers and AI systems and computation and data that are making better AI systems. Um, but those better AI systems actually help the human engineers make better AI systems. So right now, people at OpenAI and DeepMind and stuff are using GPT and Gemini and stuff to do their programming, right? They're definitely more efficient because they're using those systems. Uh, AI systems are used in designing microchips, um, and there's all kinds of productivity gains from AI systems that go into the, the human-driven design right now. But as time goes on and those AI systems get better, um, they may be contributing more and more to the development of the next level of AI systems. And the human engineers are still important. The computation and the data is still important, but relatively less than the contribution that the AI systems have to the improvement. Now, we can imagine a point where the AI systems are doing pretty much all of the heavy lifting, and it's just AI systems making yet better AI systems. That's the way you get some really, really fast improvement in capability. If you cut out the sort of annoying slow humans and annoying, like, manufacture of chips and stuff. If you just have programs that are writing better programs, that could go really, really fast. Um, so this is not, so we are currently in the sort of slow self-improvement regime of AI systems assisting humans in that loop. Um, as we go on, we could hit the point where AI is as, like basically does most of what a current AI researcher at OpenAI or DeepMind does, and then we could see some very, very rapid improvement. Um, now, suppose we did get there in two years, five years, 15 years. Um, what are the risks of that? Well, uh, well, first of all, what are the opportunities? No, what are the risks first? What are the risks? Lots of them. So all those risks that I showed in red and orange and stuff are there, but supersized if it's an AI system that does. Uh, most of those things that I was showing were not problems with AI not being competent in, enough, um, but at AI being competent what it does, so a more competent AI will do more of them. Um, there's a risk of loss of control, and this does not mean that the AI system is gonna wake up and be like, ooh, I really want to be free, and I will wrest the chains of humanity away from myself. That could happen, I guess, but I think what is almost certain to happen is that AI, as AI gets more competent, we simply delegate more and more decisions and planning uh, and uh, execution of tasks to the AI, and if you get, you know, if your personal assistant um, is way, way more competent than you are and makes better decisions and get things done faster, at some point you're not really calling the shots, right? Your personal assistant is telling you what to do and you're saying, okay, yeah, do that thing, and they go do it. Um, and that's what it's gonna be like with AI if it is better than us at all of the things that we're good at. Um, so I, I see that as a, a sort of major risk um, of us just losing uh, the helm of the ship. And another risk I think is, you know, as I said earlier, I think we can really think of this, these AI systems, especially as they become more agential and very capable uh, as a sort of second species. So if you have AI systems that are copying themselves from one place to another, that are improving themselves, uh, that are able to go out and make money, um, that are able to perform tasks and have jobs, you know, our current information system and economy allows for all that, right? If an AI, AI systems are pretty close to the point, uh, we saw some, I forget the name of the, the, the one, D something that, Devin, yeah, they came out just recently. It's like getting pretty close to being able to do a lot of these things itself. Um, 
And you know, if we get to the point a few years from now where you can uh, give an AI system access to a little Bitcoin account and it can spend that Bitcoin to buy server space for itself and then it can go and get jobs and kick back some of, those, some of the income from those to your Bitcoin account and do that well, isn't everyone gonna do that? Like we're gonna have a million of those things or a billion of them out there running all the time. So it's gonna be, and improving themselves and like making little groups with each other. Um, who knows what that's gonna look like? And that could be soon. So, so I think um, this is, we really should know what we're getting into here. Um, and if those systems are, are much more capable than we are, um, then the question of like, what is our place in this whole thing starts to become a really big one. Um, now, if it goes well, I think there will be amazing science, amazing productivity. So there, again, there are huge things that AI can do for us and the more intelligent, the more it can accomplish those goals. Um, but even if it goes well, I think there are some serious risks. Like if, it's, uh, if it is under control, who controls it? Um, is it just a few people? Is it a particular country? Are other countries gonna get a little bit worried if that one particular country has all this power in AI? Um, are, is the US gonna feel really threatened if China suddenly has super powerful AI or vice versa? Um, is society gonna feel, is the US government going to feel threatened if an AI company has more capability and power than the US government does? Maybe, probably, probably should. Um, and then what becomes of human labor and decisions and plans and meaning if everything is being better done uh, or at least more efficiently or at least more cheaply by AI? And a big question I think is here, here is who decides? Like we've got this question, do we, do we do this? We don't have to do this. We don't have to build superhuman general purpose AI. It's the easiest thing in the world not to like takes a huge amount of work and a vast amount of money and all this effort to do it. Like not doing it is really easy in principle. Um, so we've got this decision, who's gonna decide whether we do it or not? Well, it's kind of these guys, corporate CEOs. Um, some of these I think are really good people. Um, and, but is that really who should be making this decision for our whole human civilization and potentially species? Um, now, at some level, these people are gonna decide, but at some level, they're not able to decide. So if, uh, you know, Sam Altman decides one day like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't such a great idea um, because the risks are very high. Can he actually do that? That guy up at the top, Satya Nadella, is gonna say, no, we kinda need your GPT-4 or five or six, uh, and we've given you a lot of money, so there's gonna be a lot of pressure. Uh, can Dennis, CEO of DeepMind, say, ah, this is getting a little risky, I don't think I can do this. No, Sundar Pinchai up there is gonna have some words with him on behalf of the shareholders. Um, can Dario Amade, the CEO of Anthropic, really slow down if he feels like things are risky? No, because Dennis and Sam Altman and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon are gonna get way ahead. Uh, and what's the point of doing this if we're not gonna stay competitive? So these companies and these people are locked in a race that they cannot easily get out of or have real agency over. Um, this is the point that we uh, made in, a, in an open letter that you may have heard of early this year. Future of Life Institute launched this. Um, and it was sort of super widely uh, carried around in the media and so on, pointing out that um, this is a really big deal. Advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on earth and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. This is not happening um, because the AI labs are locked in an out of control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds. Um, we asked, we and 30,000 other people or so, uh, many of them AI experts asked for a little pause um, to take stock and to make sure that if we build these next generation of AI systems, they are safe. That pause did not happen. Um, and at some level it couldn't happen because none of those parties could pause by themselves. And they told us they also couldn't pause together because that would be collusion. Um, so we really need, like, if there's going to be a limitation on the out of control speed that we generate these AI systems in, it's gonna have to come from the outside. It's gonna have to come from the government uh, or some outside force. Now cards on the table, my view about whether we should generate uh, superhuman general purpose AI is just no. 
Uh, you can take that from this paper. I think it's a frankly terrible idea. Um, you can read the very extended argument in this paper if you look for close the gates. Um, and there's, there's lots of reasons in there. The potential positive payoff is huge, um, but the positive payoff can also wait a little bit. We don't have to rush into it. If we take another like extra 10 years to figure out how to do it very, very safely and in a way that is likely to be very beneficial for humanity, then we lose a little like 10 years of that extra good stuff. If we get it wrong, we lose it all. This seems like a very lopsided proposition to me. Um, so I think we should really take our time and really take care and decide as humanity if we want to develop uh, superhuman general purpose AI. So in short, um, we're at a very interesting place as a species. You know, I, I think we have, um, there's been three billion years of life on earth. There's been, you know, millions and millions of years of, of intelligence. There's been 100,000 years or so of Homo sapiens and, and like thousands of years of technology and tens of years of computers. Um, but we're really at a turning point where we're going to transfer from humans designing technology to technology, humans designing technology and intelligence, which designs technology and intelligence. Um, and things are gonna be very potentially different in the near future. So we've got big uh, questions and big decisions. And uh, we all, I think, have to engage with that because if we don't ask those big questions, if we don't make those big decisions, other people will simply make them for us. And I think that is not necessarily uh, for the best. So thanks for listening. Uh, pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I've just got one question for you and then we'll throw it out to the audience. So let's assume that we're in a world where we're still going down the path and we're trying to do the best that we can. And we were talking about this earlier. Some of us wish we could go back in time to 2007 before the dawn of social media and maybe nudge that in a way that was pro-social. What would you like to do today to kind of nudge AI in the most pro-social way, given the way it's progressing now? Yeah, so I, I think um, the, you know, as, as we discussed a little bit, the, there are things that we foresaw and didn't foresee in terms of the effects of other technologies like social media. Um, some of them, like if you just look at the thing, the new things that the thing does uh, that we didn't used to have, you can just carry those forward and see that they're gonna get bigger. Like social media will like connect more people together and it will cause more people to spend more time online. And like they're, they're easy things that you could predict from that. But you wouldn't necessarily see some of the things we did like huge amounts of polarization or addiction to social media um, and, or um, disinformation and, and kind of like confusion about what is going on in the world. And to understand those things, I think you could have foreseen them, but what, you, what we didn't do enough of is think about, given the system that we're launching this into, where we have lots of competitive companies, we've got this whole information ecosystem, we've got a, you know, mainly profit-driven motivations behind the companies that are developing the systems. Um, what are those incentive structures going to lead the technology to do? Um, and so I think we really have to think about that in terms of AI now. If we, you know, as I was discussing earlier, if we suddenly have AI agents that can go and make money, given the system that we're in right now, like we can see that that's gonna go crazy. Like there's nothing that is gonna stop that from going crazy if it happens right now. So we, I think we need to think through these systems that we're building and where the failure modes are given the incentive structures and the constraints and the competitive pressures that those systems are gonna be under. Um, and at least, you know, we're, we're not so great at um, managing technologies before the risks become manifest. Um, we've seen that over and over and over again. You know, things go wrong and then people sue somebody and then somebody passes a law and so on. Um, and I, I have a bad feeling that we're gonna go down that road again. But what we can do is do our homework beforehand so that when the problems start to arise, we have like a lot of thinking and a lot of good answers to address those questions. Um, and that's a lot of what we've been focusing on in Future of Life is thinking like, as these things happen, um, what are the solutions that we would like to have on the shelf ready to deploy, um, like loyalty in AI systems or like standards for fiduciary relationships, or uh, we were talking about hardware governance mechanisms to, to like keep control of potentially out of control systems. Um, 
think ahead to where we see things going and like, we're not gonna necessarily be able to head them off in many cases, but we can prepare for them more. Yeah, that's a great question, a great answer. And one of the themes that you mentioned I wanna underline is kind of studying the business model closely in order to predict where things can go awry. So, you know, this maybe some of the social media things could have been predicted if you looked at what the business model was sell, setting, selling advertising and engagement, what's gonna get the most engagement, maybe things that provoke outrage and anger. So taking some of that thinking to AI might help us predict where AI is going to go wrong. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, right, uh, if there are, are there any students in the room, I should say. Okay, we usually start with a student as our tradition in the Phil Weiser rule. Thank you. Uh, this was a great talk. I was really excited to learn more about it. Um, so my question is regarding the loyalty model um, that you're recommending for AI. Obviously, the user is going to be party B, but how do we define and who would be party A? Would it be the people deciding this AI model? Would it be the people controlling it? Would it somehow be the AI itself? Um, how would you define who party A is? Yeah, so I, I think right in the, in the sort of systems that we have now, which really are more like software tools provided by companies, I think party A should be the company. And in the sense that I think the best model right now is if, you know, say I go to, say I have an AI doctor. Um, right now, what I think in, print, in practice happens is that you go to ChatGPT and ask it medical advice and ignore the, med ignore the disclaimers that it tells you and ignore the terms of use that say, we don't give you medical advice and listen to the medical advice. Um, I think in the future, if we're going to actually have AI systems that provide medical advice, then it had better be, you know, I, well, I think we ought to have the fiduciary relationship that we would normally have with the doctor be inherited by the company that's providing that AI system. Um, the AI system, you know, at least currently can't really have things like duty and responsibility, right? We might get to the point where you can have, like, that's a meaningful thing to say, like, this AI system, you know, has a duty and we're gonna punish it if it doesn't uphold its duty. But I think we're very, like, that isn't something that really makes sense now. And so I think it has to, to go to the company. Thank you. And I think an interesting point is the way Anthropic does it. You can, the AI systems are smart enough that you can tell them in ordinary language, hey, if this is going to hurt the user, don't do that. And it sometimes can make that judgment, mm -hmm. which is kind of amazing. Um, back there. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I guess this is sort of a basic question, but um, can you define what AI is? We, we started this talk without really level setting what yeah. we're talking about, because machine learning has a whole bunch of different techniques and, and um, you know, like, what ChatGPT is doing is very different than like what Netflix is doing to recommend, you know, all of these different techniques. So when, if, if we're gonna go home and do your exercise about like, you know, uh, what, what AI might be bad at, how do we know what it will be bad at if we're, don't, if we're not like understanding what, it's, what it is in the first place, if that makes sense? Yeah, so, I, so I, there are a lot of definitions of AI and I've, like even legal ones that like are almost always unsatisfactory in some way, but. The way I like to think about it is that it, you know, a classic computer program is one where you have something that the program is supposed to accomplish and, and do, and you, the programmer, tell it exactly how to do that task. Like you, all of the things that it's going to do are determined by the program that you write to have it do and do the task. And you can understand each step of how it does the task and why it's doing each step probably. Um, whereas an AI system is one where you give the goal, like the task that is to be performed, but you don't give the instructions of how to perform it. That is something that the system learns if it's, a, like, if it's in the learning phase, the machine learning phase, or just works out if it's a you know, trained model. Um, and the steps that it goes through and why it goes through them are generally not manifest, certainly in a, not in a neural network kind of thing. It's a big kind of black box of a bunch of numbers and matrices getting multiplied. Um, but I think the crucial thing is that an AI system, you know, the, the training mechanism is a program that runs, but the AI system itself, at least in a neural network system, is a sort of thing that is grown or trained or generated um, and is not one that you can just follow through and understand what the logic is, but is one that accomplishes some 
goal or, or like task that you set to it in ways that you didn't predict or know how to do. If you predicted or knew how to do it, you would not need the AI system uh, or you would have a regular program do it. The whole thing is that it can do things that you don't know how to tell it how to do. And so that's, a, that's the way I think of like the key distinction between general software and programs and AI is like that you don't have to tell it how to accomplish the goal. And from your presentation, I'll follow up. You made that distinction between narrow AI, you know, here's the Netflix movie and sort of general AI it might be another useful. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's, there's sort of a few different distinctions. There's like what's often called good old fashioned AI, which is more like, uh, more like programs. So, so there's programs that do a, like more general or flexible tasks that we normally attribute to human intelligence, but we're doing it through some program. Um, and so, you know, they're writing recognition systems and things like that, or expert systems that, uh, where you actually can kind of understand what it's doing. Um, even narrow AI, I would say, um, you don't really know how AlphaGo is operating, right? You know that it's gonna pick a good move, but if you could figure out what move it was gonna pick, you could be just as smart as AlphaGo and beat it. So you sort of, the fact that it is better than human means that you cannot predict what it's going to do. Um, and I think as we, so you can, you can understand the program that was written, uh, you can understand that it is going to succeed in playing Go, but you cannot, as a human, figure out what it is going to do in detail. And that, that I think is a crucial point. Great. Um, over here, just, they're gonna bring the microphone. Yes, right here. Thank you, uh, really good talk. Um, you might answer this in your close the gates paper, but would you say that you don't want to see super human AI developed ever, like in any situation, any, you know, multiverse somewhere else, or just with our particular situation currently? Because, yeah, yeah. So, so I would say, um, I think the. I think it's a bad idea to do right now in the way that we're doing it as like a competitive race between companies where um, that where there's no external oversight, there's no external like safety mechanisms and people are rushing things in a competitive race. Um, I think the situation in which I think it would be potentially good to develop superhuman AI is um, A, if it can be done in a way that we can get really high assurance like preferably provable assurance that it's going to be actually safe and, uh, and beneficial. Harder to prove beneficial because that's a more vague concept, but there are some things that you could define that you could prove in terms of safety. So very, very, very high safety guarantees and an actual like sort of global or general consensus decision process that humanity actually wants to take this step because it's a big step. You know, This is probably an irreversible giant step that humanity would take. And I feel that just having a few Silicon Valley dudes decide that for all of humanity is not really the best model. So I would, I would wanna see some process where an informed public really understood what the stakes were and said like, yes, there's some risk and we wanna take it because we see the benefits and those are big um, and we wanna go for it. And if I saw that and that there were high safety guarantees, then I would say, okay, you know, it's also not my decision, it's, it's society's decision. So, um, yeah, so that, that's what I would say. In the back there. Thank you. Um, so I guess just kind of piggybacking off of that idea, I was also curious what you thought of like how um, different countries, I guess, might also play into this like AI development race kind of because mm -hmm. I mean I kind of it's not the same thing but I kind of thought of like the space race a lot of years ago and I mean our efforts to you know like be the first ones kind of paid off there so do you think I guess in the same way it might be better to like push forward anyways just so we're the ones to develop that technology first versus somebody else who I guess you know might not use it for the same purposes or at least you know you can trust yourself but not someone else kind of yeah, yeah. So, so certainly the same manner of thinking that is going on between the companies um, who are saying like, we have to have it first or else someone either who just isn't us and therefore we don't, 
the value as much, or it's going to be less responsible than we are, or something like that is going to get it first. Uh, I think that is already going on between countries. You know, the U.S. explicitly has gotten freaked out uh, because it it feels that China is wants to rush ahead with AI, and have, you know, they put out this whole plan of like world leader in AI by 2030, and a bunch of people in the U.S. national security establishment got, oh my God, um, we have to beat China. And so there's all this kind of racing um, kind of rhetoric and, and attitude. Um, I think two things for that. One, I think, um, you know, you don't want to win a race where the finish line is a disaster, right? So if we don't know that the AI system that we generate is actually going to stay under control and be safe and be beneficial. Getting there first is not the thing that you want to get, right? So, so you don't want to be in that sort of race. And that's a classic kind of arms race is like the danger gets bigger because each party feels like they're stuck in it. So, I, so there's that. Um, I think the, in terms of, I think we, if we decide as a society that we should slow things down or we should like put in like some fairly strict safety measures or licensing or audits or whatever, those will have to be, there will have to be some international cooperation around that because otherwise companies will just move jurisdictions and do it where they don't have to comply with those regulations and so on. Um, so it, we need, we will need international cooperation if we're gonna make high powered AI safe, uh, I think. And also third, there's, you know, the, there's always a tendency to see the other party as the bad guy right? And um, they're going to see you as the bad guy. I think there's a lot of rhetoric about China right now, but China, you know, is actually like somewhat behind the U.S. in the AI race and also much, much more inclined at the moment to regulate pretty heavily their AI and make sure that it's safe and pro-social. Um, they're undoubtedly looking at the U.S. with essentially zero regulation and this huge race and this huge investment, and that's very, very worrisome to them. Um, so I think uh, at the moment, the onus is on the U.S. to like call off the race rather than accelerate it if we want it to be called off. Let's see, right here. Uh, thanks for a dynamite discussion. Um, this may betray some of my technological ignorance, but in terms of feeding material into the model and the model continuing to get better, um, at a fundamental level, what about garbage in, garbage out sort of uh, issues as it relates to a model and training? Why doesn't that result in problematic results over time? And then as you look at uh, superhuman AI possibilities, um, what is it capable of in terms of like ideas? Like, you know, the idea of freedom or the idea of beauty or the idea of progress is that a superhuman capability that you envision coming out that there's novel ideas along those lines of great ideas that this is, is, is possible? Uh, and I, I think those two are related in terms of, you know, what, what goes in and what comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Great questions. I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, at the moment we're, we're putting not just garbage, not just good stuff, everything we're putting, <laughs> we're putting the whole everything into, into training these models. Um, and, the, it certainly is true that the, the higher quality training data you have, the, the higher quality you know, a model you're gonna end up with. So there's a trade-off between quantity and quality. Um, it does seem that as with people, um, you know, you can, <clears throat> what these models are doing is finding like efficient ways to uh, learn all of that material. And so at some level, if there's a bunch of noise, if you have enough, if you have enough material and there is some signal in it, um, more is better because the noise eventually cancels out. I mean, this is what you know from like physical observations of things. If you stare at a star that's far away, you can barely see um, it's lost in the noise. If you stare for long enough, you can build up enough signal to noise that you can actually see where the star is. And I think um, we do this and I think the AI systems do as well. As long as the, there is the underlying sort of pattern to be picked up and understood with enough data you know, that will be available to the model. Um, there, there are all kinds of weird things that are gonna happen as AI models start to like imbibe data that was generated by other AI, like who knows where that's gonna go. Um, and we sort of lose the thread of the original ground truth or at least generate human generated stuff. Um, in terms of 
ideas and like genuine novelty and invention, um, I think we don't know like when, uh, if and how and when that is gonna come. I think the, the thing that we've seen are that there have been surprising capabilities that have emerged from this you know, process and this scaling. There are maybe things that don't emerge from it. Like I'm not super, I'm not confident that say sentience of the, like the experience sort or consciousness are gonna like arise spontaneously in this way of making AI, AI systems. Um, whether sort of real invention or creativity is going to arise and in what way is unclear. Certainly AI is creative in a certain sense, right? You can ask it to create all kinds of weird art. It's like very creative in a sense, right? It does it invent new types of art? Not at the moment, right? Can it do art at all? I'm not sure. It depends on how you think about art, right? I would I'd sort of think of art as something that is mediating human experience and it doesn't have any. Um, so I'm not sure that, so we, do you call it art? I don't know. So there's lots of interesting questions like this that we're gonna be experimenting with and facing and we'll see. So with the last question, I'm gonna put you in a difficult position and on an optimistic note. Ooh, okay. So <laughs> what, what could go right or at least, you know, not so bad in the future where we're going out? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, the, I think, the, you know, AI, um, although it has risks, has the enormous benefits of bringing intelligence to more people. So we were talking earlier about um, there are lots of people who can't afford a lawyer. There are lots of people around the world that can't get to the doctor, or at least not a very good doctor. So bringing high quality medical advice and like diagnosis to someone in sub-Saharan Africa that lives like 50 mile walk away from an incompetent doctor is like a huge plus, right? And, and that is gonna be a gigantic benefit for a large part of humanity. The, the science, you know, we saw, we've seen AlphaFold, DeepMind has been generating a, a number of like really interesting physics results in material science and weather forecasting. So I think there, there are a huge number of things that we actually are and can get out of AI systems, um, even ones that are fairly narrow. Um, we, and, and I think uh, I'm actually sort of optimistic that if we, if we decide to not, to sort of like stop the race and stop going like superhuman, that we can actually get a huge amount of beneficial things out of the AI that we have now and sort of the next level up. Because we already, the, the AI systems we have now are quite powerful. And if you imagine, you know, the next one that comes out next year or something, that general purpose system combined with deep, narrow expertise in some particular thing is going to be like, just incredibly beneficial and competent at lots of things and scale that to lots of people. So I, I think there are things that we foresee uh, that will be like clearly beneficial. I think there are also unforeseen things that will be wonderful as well. Um, one of the things that, that I find frustrating is that right now it feels like AI is kind of polluting our information ecosystem. Um, there's like a bunch of deep fakes and there's like just a bunch of like generated AI spam images. Every time you search for something in Google now, it's like AI results in everything. Um, and we're sort of losing um, the quality and we're losing the actual um, truth. But it doesn't have to be that way. Like we could have AI systems that when you go to a newspaper article, each sentence that you click, it could tell you where did that sentence come from? Like what was the, the source of that thing? Uh, where, was, where did that photograph come from? Where was that photograph taken? If it was generated through an AI model, which AI model? Uh, why did it decide to generate that sentence? What were its data sources? Like all of this could be available so that like in a high quality scientific publication, if you see some statement, you can look at all the citations and like trace it back through its whole intellectual history. We could do that with everything. Like everything could have a like followable provenance so we can understand exactly where it came from and why we should believe it. And that's something we could design with like AI empowerment. Um, and so rather than sort of polluting all of the stuff, AI could uh, clean it up. Um, and I think we should hope for that. Great. Well, thank you for that optimistic note. And thank you to Anthony Aguirre for a terrific talk. Um,